So welcome to uh, our last uh, full-on session. Um, the title of, uh, of our next uh, uh, part of the program is We Don't Know What We Don't Know, Multi-Sector and Multidisciplinary Experience to Break Down Barriers. This is going to be a panel discussion moderated by Professor Lisa Hinchliffe of the University of Illinois. The panel will, in will include Gwen Evans, Vice President for Global Library Relations at Elsevier, Keith Webster, Dean of Libraries at Carnegie Mellon University, and uh, Karen Wolf, Library Director at Brown University. And uh, we'll welcome them to the stage and turn it over to Lisa. Thank you, Rick. Uh, we are slideless for this session. I don't know if that's allowed. We obviously forgot something really important. <laughs> oh, <laughs> because as librarians, that's really important to us, information structure and order. <laughs> Great. Uh, so thank you, Rick. Um, I want to welcome everyone uh, to this final panel of the conference, and thank you for sticking with us to, to the end. This is my first time at the Research to Reader conference in person. I've attended from my dining room table. It was much less satisfactory. I've greatly enjoyed the opportunity to be here today. And I'm very excited to explore this topic with our panelists today, the sometimes controversial topic of switching sides. Um, that's the milder version of the going to the dark side that we might say in libraries sometimes, which even assumes that there are sides. Um, from a positive framework or appreciative inquiry focus, looking at the affordances and opportunities that emerge through changing posi positionality in the overall research support ecosystem is another way for us to think about this. So skipping over the introductions that Rick just did, um, Gwen, I'm going to start with you. You had a long career in libraries before starting at Elsevier just a few years ago. Could you tell us a bit about your background and what led you to making the switch? It's supposed to be might? Yeah. Probably. Maybe you'll just come up here. Okay. <laughs> Can you read the question again? Because I was worried about the mic. Why did, you Why did I switch? OK, so in terms of my background, sort of the foundational background that I, that I want to foreground is that before I was a librarian, I was trained as a cultural anthropologist at the University of Chicago. And I spent two years doing field work in Indonesia with the Roman Catholic Church. So a lot of my subjects were um, Roman Catholic priests with uh, degrees in sociology and theology. And so, but that fundamental um, uh, orientation to an anthropological look at what is happening on the ground, why is it happening, you know, that, that what is the system there, I, n that never leaves me. So that is how I approach both librarianship and now working for Elsevier. So I started in circulation and access services, got my library degree, um, worked as uh, uh, my first uh, faculty job. My first and only faculty job was as the head of library IT at Bowling Green State University. And if you know anything about libraries, circulation and access services can be very technical anyway. And then I became the head of uh, library IT and um, it was very, uh, uh, hot at the time to have the title of coordinator of emerging technologies, if you remember that. Um, and while I was there, I realized that my ba what I do well is I'm a fixer. So various in various jobs, I came in to fix a dysfunctional department or a department that needed changes because some, a well-beloved head of access services had just retired, but they realized they needed changes. So that is sort of a skill set that I developed as being a fixer. And then I was recruited to be the executive director of OhioLink, which is both a state agency and a member organization. It's a, it reports to the Department of Higher Education in the state of Ohio. It has 118 libraries as members. 
it has a budget of about $60 million, $40 million more or less is um, content. Tom Sandville invented the big deal and I've probably negotiated with most of the major publishers <laughs> and some, some, even some uh, society publishers in this room. When I took over, it had been run by a non-librarian for three years and it was a hot, hot, hot mess. Um, they had technology infrastructure problems, which is why they recruited me, but there were trust issues with the membership. There was a fiscal agent transition, which some of you, if you remember 2013, I apologize for that, um, because it took very long, it took a very long time to, to um, get the contracts renewed, to pay the bills. So again, I was there as a fixer. So at the end, and one of the, th the important things about Ohio Link is that technological infrastructure. They load publisher content and ebook content onto their own platforms. They run a statewide ETD, electronic and theses, um, dissertation open access problem. So there's this vast technological infrastructure. So while I was there, I got a look at what it really takes to develop and uh, serve up published content, open access content. There was a, a institutional repository program at scale. And I realized how critical it was that what publishers did to make that content available and accessible in this sort of weird environment. And also that stakeholder alignment with the uh, state legislature um, who directly handed out the capital and operating budget for Ohio Link was also a big, big factor. So by the end of, so I was there for seven years and in 2019, it was stable. I had a great, great staff who are still there. I hired most of them. And I was getting a little bored <laughs> with boring ex operational excellence. And I also felt like that given the state funding level and, and the way a red state legislature works, that I was, it was unlikely that I was ever going to get the kind of funding that would allow us to do something really innovative or really exciting. So, I was at Charleston in 2019. I saw Kumsal Bayezid there, the new CEO of Elsevier, and I met with her and they started recruiting me and I thought I could work for this company under Kumsal. And some, so when it was announced that I was moving to Elsevier, I got, did get three pictures of Darth Vader texted for me, to me from my friends. And uh, a library dean asked me, why this is not the move that I had envisioned for you. And I said, never underestimate the curiosity I have about other cultures. And if you're gonna learn publishing, this is sort of big publishing at the coal face. So part of my, my move was uh, the, the, with the desire to learn how the sausage is made. And the other thing is, as I said, I'm a fixer and I love a hot mess. And when someone said, can you help improve the relationship between libraries and Elsevier? I said, that sounds like fun. So that's the... <laughs> I'm gonna ask you in a little bit whether it's actually turned out to be fun. Um, okay, now that we have the microphone situations uh, worked out here, um, I'll stay up here, um, but okay, Keith, I'm gonna turn to you now. Um, your experience have not only been multi-sectoral, but also multi-country, multinational. Um, so can you tell us a bit about your background and what are the threads that you can draw through your varied experiences as soon as one of the mics start, starts working? Yep. That's working. Okay, thanks, Lisa. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to over-theoritize this, but let me begin with the triple helix of university industry government relations, and, and often that is constructed as a way of framing 
um, economic and social development. And my career has unintentionally charted that path where I've had at least a couple of stints in each of government, universities and industry. And I've served on the leadership team of at least one organisation in each of these domains. I think what's really interesting is where you see these three domains collaborating together, that sweet spot <coughs> where industry, government and the academy collaborate to advance society. But even the, the bilateral aspects, let's say university and government overlapping, you know, lead to interesting policy conversations and advancing the knowledge society. So in the university space, I've held library leadership roles, university library and dean of libraries, that, that sort of title, at four very different research intensive universities in four different countries. Here in the UK, mm -hmm. um, New Zealand, Australia and the United States. What has been interesting is that each of these universities has had a very distinctive mm -hmm. academic profile. So number one, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, was at the School of Oriental and African Studies just down the road from here, which has a very strong focus on humanities, social sciences, languages, cultures, area studies. In New Zealand, um, I was at Victoria University of Wellington in the capital city with strength in public policy, law, government studies, those sorts of areas. In Australia, I was at the University of Queensland, a massive medical operation with a university attached. <laughs> and at Carnegie Mellon, we have the really interesting dual strengths of technology, especially through computer science and AI, and a very large engineering school, but complemented in Andrew Carnegie's vision by a conservatory with you know, truly elite programs in drama, music, and art. And those have allowed me to get a sense of the broad sweep of disciplinary behaviours and how things like the scholarly record mm -hmm. vary by discipline and the competing opportunities, the overlapping um, interests that we can see play out there. What has also been interesting is doing those jobs in four very different countries. Now, admittedly, three of them have the king on the back of their coins <laughs> if they've caught up with recent events. Um, so th there clearly are similarities, but there are also distinctive differences. Um, Australia and New Zealand very much bicultural societies. And looking at the academic practice and the research culture in those different countries is also very interesting, as is the ability to watch publishers negotiating tactics in different geographies and different markets. Um, one big global publisher is not the same in each country in which it operates. In the government side of things, my first library job was in a, a government research laboratory in this country. Um, I was quickly asked to add on EU policy work to that, um, but my a substantial role in government was leading a policy directorate at the Treasury, about two miles in that direction. Um, and that also gave me the opportunity to understand policy making. One of the areas we looked at in my time was the early wave of thinking about scientific journals and business models and whether open access might actually become a thing. That was you know, 20 years ago and here we are today. In industry, I did the typical late 1980s graduate thing of training as an accountant with Ernst & Young, uh, but in 2011, following a very similar conversation to the one that Gwen described, I joined Wiley as VP of Global Academic Relations, not library relations, but dealing with university leaders. And at that point, I, I joined Wiley's offices in Hoboken in New Jersey, and that was the move to the United States. Um, what I, I found also is that in the university space, in almost every case, I've been asked to take on very non-library jobs in addition to overseeing libraries. And I currently look after a bunch of academic departments, interdisciplinary programs and university initiatives such as sustainability. And that has helped me understand how the library is perceived on campus and how best to collaborate across the institution, um, you know, very much to make everything better where possible. Um, finally, the, the other point I'd make is that I have a, 
almost a separate identity as a consultant, especially focused on futures and um, foresight studies. And I'm often invited to serve on government and industry bodies. My boss periodically says it would be nice to see me on campus. Yeah. I think Lisa can relate to that. Um, and, and those opportunities help me again spread that network from the node of the library into other fields. And it keeps me engaged with the triple helix. Great. See, I haven't entered administration, so no one knows whether I'm there or not <laughs> as a faculty member. Um, so, Keith, I really appreciate this. We just had a chance to visit over Thanksgiving when I was in Pittsburgh, and I'm, I'm always struck by your clear vision and mission-driven perspectives on the work that you've done in these different sectors. Um, Karen, I might characterize your career as layered, with your work in various sectors overlapping. And I'm particularly interested to hear how you have paired your work as a scholar and professor with your shift to publishing and library work. So can you tell us a little bit about that pathway? Sure. Um, first of all, thank you for asking me to join this panel, Lisa. It's always interesting to be in conversation with this um, very dynamic group of people. So I am a kind of a standard issue academic historian. Um, I spent 10 years at American University in Washington, DC. I spent over a decade at William & Mary, which is part of the Virginia um, public university system, and now I'm at Brown University. Uh, I am an early Americanist. I work on 18th century British America. I am still doing research. I spent the morning over at friend's house working with 18th century materials that I've been, some of the same ones I've been working with for decades. I'm publishing still, and I'm still um, advising PhD students. So far, so legible, right? Um, but also, um, I have had uh, the opportunity to work um, and to lead organizations that are very much in my field and in my bailiwick, and I think in my strike zone. Um, I, and in the last two cases, independent organizations, independent of the universities where I was working. So I'm super, anybody who's spent even two minutes in my company will know that I'm pretty intense about the value of the humanities and about the significance of history in particular for all of us and the value. Uh, you know, I always say authoritarians understand exactly how powerful and important history is and democracies ought to spend a lot more time investing in historical research and teaching. Um, so that intensity is possibly one of the things that has led me to think kind of more broadly about how my field and my discipline sits within this broader industry of what Mark calls researcher um, to reader, but which we might think of as a kind of global expert knowledge um, economy engine. Uh, so I led a research institute for about eight years, which is focused in early American history and which publishes a leading journal in the field, also publishes books in collaboration with UNC Press, and also funds research in the field. So I was experiencing life as a publisher and trying to figure out what that meant. Um, and I'm extremely grateful to Rick Anderson and David Crotty for having asked me to write and not just keep talking about what open access might mean for small, um, very nonprofit um, publishers in the humanities um, and the kind of economic implications of mandatory OA policies and to uh, continue to encourage me to write for the scholarly kitchen about the humanities. Um, but having that opportunity to kind of think, lift up and think about how my field sat and how it was being influenced um, by what I think we all in this room know drives scholarly communications, which is not my field at all. My field is like what? I don't know, like the tiniest tip of the tail on a mastiff or something like that. I don't know. We're like the smallest piece of a really large um, enterprise. And now I run a rare books library. I'm not actually the library director at Brown. Joe Mizell, my colleague, would be startled to know that. Uh, <laughs> a library director. So, you know, and actually not even so. I run an independent research library that is on the campus of Brown. And yes, I'm a tenured faculty member at Brown. It's all very complicated. But anyway, I direct uh, the John Carter Brown Library, which is a rare book library. It's one of the greatest in the world. Um, of materials um, focused on, about, and produced in the Americas between the 1500s and the early 1800s. And it's an extraordinary collection. I'll talk about that um, with, I think, Lisa's next collection. 
But the, what that's let me do really is experience in some ways leadership um, through the full cycle of what researchers in my world experience. That is the primary materials that we engage with, the process of review and collaboration that produces research and its publication and dissemination. But mostly, I'm a historian, and I'll come back to that at the end. <laughs> Great. Great. Um, so it's clear to, I think, all of us that you each had a very interesting career to date. I know just that we've sat the historian next to the futures -ist. Um This might be also a little bit of full circle-ness. Um, so, you know, a lot of you have held uh, leadership positions in different sectors. Um, so let's dig into this a little bit. I'm going to ask you to think back to a time when you were transitioning either to or from librarianship. So that, that transition, or to publishing. And what was your biggest surprise as you joined that new community of practice? So if you were going from librarianship to publishing, or publishing to librarianship, or what have you. So Keith, I'm going to start with you this time. Since I've made both journeys, I'll <clears throat> maybe give you a couple of points on, on each aspect. My move into publishing was fascinating, and I gained a deep understanding of the value that publishers add. And I'm very open about the fact that, having been with Wiley, I understand the value that publishers do add, as well as some of the insights from societies on whose behalf Wiley, in particular, publishes. What surprised me in a very pleasant way was how closely connected many of my colleagues in Wiley were to the research enterprise. Many retained active research roles in addition to their publishing responsibilities. And they truly believed that they were there to make science better, um, to, to advance science. Of course, there is a profit imperative in a commercial publishing house, but that always felt like a, a different part of the business. So I, I was really encouraged by that observation. I was also struck and Wiley, I, I appreciate, is an outlier by the extent of society relations and the comp complexity of business models. You know, if you're publishing on behalf of, let's say, 900 or 1,000 societies, you can't unilaterally impose certain decisions. You cannot say all our journals will be hybrid. You need the societies to agree to that. You need the societies to agree what the APC might be. So there was a a surprising amount of policy negotiation that I hadn't fully anticipated. Uh, one thing that struck me, something that I've taken back into the academy, is the importance of finance and how, at Wiley, our weekly leadership team meetings started with a deep dive into the finances. And I do the, the same in thinking about my library. Um, clearly, the, the value of money is, is, is somewhat different, but it does help me make more informed decisions. Uh, I was also struck by the, the global aspect of the role and understanding how a business decision in one market might have a ripple effect. And it reminded me of an experience when I was in Australia where a publisher that might be represented on the stage um, agreed with a small group of Australian universities to allow alumni access to um, their platform and then word quickly got around the planet and sadly that had to be reversed because the ripple effect was going to be much bigger than a few universities at the other end of the planet. Uh, a surprising turn for me, and, and Gwen alluded to this as well, was how whilst I was in publishing my former colleagues um, treated me, or some of them. A little while into my time at Wiley I was asked to speak at an event at SILIP, the Chartered Institute of Librarians and Information Professionals, of which I'm both a chartered and an honorary fellow. And the session moderator was somebody I'd known for 20 plus years. And he could barely talk to me and then eventually um, complained about how I'd sold out and how could I get up in the morning and all of that sort of <laughs> stuff. And I had varying shades of that. Interestingly, one from a <clears throat> colleague who is now working for a commercial publisher. But that, that's, um, turning to the present, I've learned a lot, as, as I said, about the value that publishers add and the costs incurred in publishing. And it's given me a much richer sense of what value looks like in negotiations 
both for the publisher and for the university. And I hope that that has helped me be a good partner with publishers as we negotiate transformative agreements. Um, I'm also reassured by the extent to which publishers come to Carnegie Mellon amongst other institutions to ask us to collaborate on development projects, R&D initiatives, you know, often under NDAs, but I think that there's a, a real appreciation that that joined up understanding of a university research enterprise and a publishing house um, can yield insights that are beneficial to both parties. Great, thank you, Keith. Karen, how about you? So, um, people often think that historians want to talk about change over time and that that's our primary task. Um, I'm a historian mostly of women and gender and politics, and so as a contrarian anyway, uh, I always say that actually it's the continuities that are often most striking. Gender wage gap, for example, since the 16th century, pretty constant. Anyway, just saying, continuity is really <laughs> important to understand and to know about. So one of the things that is pretty striking to me, I think, is the continuities. Um, so, you know, I think we all have this experience. Maybe it's your neighbor. You know, maybe it's someone you work with. People always think that other people's work is easy and the job they do might be done for free. You know? <laughs> and you're like, what? So it, it is striking to me that I think this is what you're talking about when you're saying like understanding the value. People think that publishing should be free. People think that they can, Google can do librarian work. People think, you know, all these, these things are kind of bananas. There's a kind of constancy to, if you begin to understand the kind of work that's involved in any sector, then you begin to appreciate the deeper value there. And for sure, that's, that's, been, that's a continuity. But I actually wanted to talk about um, across these kinds of two small organizations that I've been running, a research institute which was publishing and a library now, the real continuities are just that the basics, mission and management, those are the keys. You know, understanding your mission and understanding clearly and being able to articulate the significance of your mission and then aligning it obviously with your budget, go forward, retrospective, whatever, and then thinking about management. And one of the things that I think gets at your question, Lisa, is like, I'm not a librarian. How can you step in and be a library director? I get this question, I got to go to BYU and talk to librarians with Rick about like, how can you be a library director if you're not a librarian? There's a real inherent question there. And I think um, it's the answer is the same in how could I be a publisher with a group of highly expert editors? And the answer is like good management respects the expertise of the people in your organization, whether they are librarians who are catalogers, who do rare book cataloging, which is its own super thing and amazing, or whether they are developmental editors or copy editors or metadata creators, you, you know, good management is respecting the expertise and harnessing the expertise of the people in your organization and harnessing that to your mission. So the continuity, I think, has been actually striking for me. There are some really cool differences. Like, you know, in my job when my eyes are bleeding from, you know, negotiating with HR about something, I can actually just go into the stacks and look at 17th century manuscripts and it soothes my historian <laughs> soul. So that is a difference for sure. Um, but the continuities in organizational basics have really struck me. That's great. Um, Gwen, you and I have talked about this a fair bit over time, so I think I might have some sense of what you might say, but you might surprise me now. So what hit you as you moved from librarianship to publishing? So actually, the themes are very similar from Keith and from Karen, um, but I joined Elsevier on February 28th of 2020, and I made it to one in-person meeting, and then the world shut down. And my job was really actually to be out talking to librarians, being an honest broker of information both back to Elsevier and out to librarians, and I couldn't do that. But I did have the chance to work with an amazing team that was sort of tracking the, the pandemic and the effects on higher ed, the effects on libraries, the effects on researchers. So I really, I have to say that I was 
surprised at how well Elsevier managed that because they're a vast global company and they were very welcoming and we were all in it together. And so I, to me, it surprised me how well I personally felt enfolded into the organization under very, very challenging conditions. But I think the most surprising thing to me is um, how like these often hostile or, uh, organizations or um, groups are to each other while having a lot of similarity. So to the point of researchers, I've been, at, <laughs> I've been told by a faculty member, um, how hard can it be to put a book on the shelf? Well, it's hard. There's a, lot, there's a lot of hidden work. There's a lot of expertise. There's a lot of funding and business models that underlie that handing over a book at the circulation desk or you sitting in your office getting all of JSTOR for free. What do I need the library for? That was also told, you know, said to me. And at the other side, that librarians and sometimes researchers will will take a peek at you know whatever it takes to um, deliver the output of a PDF or an article and just sort of assume that the output doesn't encode or embody an enormous amount of complex and expert work behind the scenes. And one of the things that, you know, I, I had a vague idea about it, but the whole issue of how hard publishing works on research integrity is amazing to me. But I have heard, you know, negotiators or researchers say, it's a PDF, how hard, how expensive can that be to produce? So, but it's a, it's a very similar um, almost assumption that you, that you know the amount of work and expertise in the output. And the metaphor, I think in analogies and metaphors, so the metaphor that, I, that I've come up with and I've discussed with them is, it's as though each group opens the door to a very complex high-tech factory and they stick their head in and they look around and then they withdraw and say, I know how that works. And it's not true of the library and it's not true of publishing and it's not true of research either. Is that we've had a lot of sessions on what is the, the one this morning was great. What is a research culture? How does it work? differently across the world because in a global role that has been a revelation also is that you think you know how science is done or how research is done and yet it's incredibly diverse with different expectations and different incentives and different barriers. So I think that that if I, the great gift to going over the wall as I called it mm -hmm. is that I get a look at the, all those complexities and how really there's more similarities than there are differences. It's interesting, whether you're trained in anthropology like Gwen is or not, you clearly you end up being an anthropologist of your new community as you try and make sense of it and figure it out and sort of what's valued here and who's the actual power players versus the, the sort of hierarchy or the like. So I'm gonna ask one more question before we open it up to all of you so that's your alert to get your questions started. Um, what do you think you've been able to accomplish in your organizations because you had experience in other sectors? So I'm, I'm giving you a chance to actually brag on yourself a little bit. Um, but um, we know that you're all very successful, so you're here because of that. So Karen, what have you been able to accomplish because you have these multi-sectoral experiences in the research enterprise? Um, I think I'm going to interpret that question a little bit, Lisa. Um, really, as a historian, you're going to do that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know. So I think, I mean, the greatest privilege, I think, is to, is to work on behalf of researchers and uh, with a conviction that their work can do such great work in the world. Um, that's the thing I feel most passionate about. 
um, and the opportunity that I'm, I'm just super grateful for. I think in terms of my roles, I really, I mean, I know it sounds cheesy to say, like, I'm always acting as a historian. It sounds like a tagline or something. I don't know. Um, but honestly, I really do feel that that has been a core strength for me, that when I approach an organization or even when I approach, not like an anthropologist, actually, not like, but like a historian, when I've approached kind of trying to understand scholarly communications, I'm always asking, what is the context for this? What is the deeper context of this? You know, we're all living in a world in which nations um, and peoples have told themselves stories over time. And some of those stories, sometimes they're called histories, are having an enormous impact. And some of those are just flat out completely and utterly wrong. Organizations do the same things. They tell themselves stories about what they're doing and why they're doing it and who's been doing it. And when you can back up and ask for the context, sometimes you're able to peel back and say, actually, that thing, we never were doing that. This thing, well, okay, we should stop doing that 100%. <laughs> and actually let us reorient towards the thing that we really, really should be doing. And all of that, you know, kind of, no, we weren't, we should stop, we should start, implicates resources, time, money, energy. Um, so I feel like that kind of perspective as a historian has been really important for both of the organizations that I've led the last um, decade or so in kind of um, reorienting our and um, amplifying mission. Great. Um, so Keith, do you have a thought here? <clears throat> sure, and, and let me build on Karen's observation as, as I begin that research libraries and research publishers exist primarily to improve research and there is very much a shared mission if you think about it from that, that higher perspective. I think to your specific question, Lisa, mm -hmm. um, my experiences probably have played out most clearly in the work we've done around open access and um, what I've learned about the realities inside a publisher and the realities inside a university have come together in a way that helps me hopefully um, foster intelligent conversations on campus and to get beyond the mathematicians or pick your favorite discipline mm -hmm. wanting to put pick your favorite publisher out of business and appreciate that a rapid unraveling of publishing in that way would not only put publishers out of business but quite possibly put the research community out of business or jeopardize the way in which it does business around recognition reward and and so on but i also advocate strongly for author rights retention as a way of achieving some of that long-term change that the research community seeks. I think there is a growing acceptance that an author payment rather than a reader payment model is the way in which at least the next wave of transition will unfold. Um, I appreciate the concerns that some publishers feel about that, but equally I'm not sure that the research community has figured out how to, and especially in the US, how to manage that transition. Um, I don't know how many universities in the US subscribe to a typical publisher's content, but it's probably a couple of thousand universities. Um, more than half of research articles in the US are published by the 71 members of the Association of American Universities. So how do you shift the distribution of subscription revenue to authorship costs in a net zero model. We haven't figured that out yet. Uh, another point I'd make is that I think my posts in government helped me understand how policy can best be developed and implemented. And at Wiley, I learned a lot about you know, operating a business, um, enhancing my, my leadership skills, because when you're running a big library system in a big university, you are managing lots of people and a substantial budget. A final point that I'd make is that I, I do believe that an academic community should be an international community and having a diverse international population exposes our faculty, our students to a wider range of thoughts and ideas, different styles of learning, um, various backgrounds and biases. And I do think to the anthropologist type questions we've been having, that uh, different cultures can come together to create a whole that is 
better than the sum of its parts. And I see that exemplified and embodied in the best research universities and, honestly, in the best international publishers. So Gwen, I, I'll turn to you last on this because in some ways this bringing up perspective is actually your whole job. <laughs> so um, I'm guessing you could probably talk for hours about bringing the library perspective to Elsevier and vice versa, but I'm wondering if you could highlight some of the things that are examples of things you've been most able to contribute to this mutual understanding mission that you have. So I would say that um, <clears throat> this was a surprise to me just how Little, although having been on the negotiating side of the library with many different kinds of publishers and vendors, I don't know why it surprised me so much, but it's that um, ex the explanation of how decision collection development decisions actually get made at the institution and the consortial level. And uh, one of my staff, uh, when I was at Ohio, like one of the staff members said, when you know one consortium, you know one consortium. So I just want to flag that Ohio Link is, is a particular kind of consortium. But th there were a lot of misperceptions about um, who makes the decision. I, I kept saying over and over again, library directors are not making content decisions. There's a committee and they're all sort of, they're given a budget and they all have to gr agree on what allocation is going where and these are the frustrations and the, the pressures on them. Um, I spent the whole you know, first year saying, no, their budgets really are that bad. No, their budgets are that bad. Their budgets are that bad. And I got listened to. It may not feel like that if you're a librarian, <laughs> but they did, they, they listened to me. And I had access at very high levels to explain this is how the decisions are getting made. This is the budget pressures on them. One of the things that was really, was really interesting to me, but also is a, when I go out globally and talk to other librarians, is explaining the United States context and the way public education is funded. The United States is not Sweden. It never will be Sweden. <laughs> Ohio is not Wisconsin, is not California. And the way that the money <clears throat> flows, as Michael Clark, of Clark and Esposito once said, um, the money is in the wrong buckets in the US for a transition in the way that many other librarians expect to happen when they're in Europe. They expect the same transition to happen in the same way here, and it just won't. Because legislator, legislators in Texas and Florida are now looking at higher ed and scrutinizing in a, in, a, it, in a way that is not true in California or Illinois, for example. So that was sort of one of the um, discourses, so not only within the company, but also with other librarians wondering like, when the US is going to get on board. Um, but the other thing is, is really simple things. I, this, cracks me up every time I think about it, and I cherish it. So one of the things I do is, you know, give, like, in, in the interpretation of the, like, this is why they're saying this, this is, this is what it means, this is maybe the pressures. So I had a very earnest question about, okay, we're, we're going in and, and we're having these questions and we're going to ask the librarians these questions. And one of the questions was, why is it so important to have whole book ILL? Now, if you're a librarian, that is such a weird question. And I said, look, <laughs> look, don't ask that because they're either going to think you're punking them on purpose and it's going to make them mad, or they're going to think, when is the shuttle going back to the mothership? When do you have to be back in Pluto? But in, like, they were used to an article economy they don't really understand what happens with ILL. So it was that little bit of interpretation, whereas this is what, when you go to the bookstore, do you expect the whole book? When you go to the library, do you expect the whole book? Everyone in ILL expects the whole book, and that's why they care about it <clears throat> so much. But I just, it was an honest question. They just didn't understand really 
ILL because it's a big journal. Like, we don't do a lot of books. We do a lot of journals. So. Great. I think we have to give some of these mics to Mark. If, uh, just one? Okay, Gwen, I guess you're the one who's going to give it up. Um, so let me turn to you, audience. Um, what questions do you have for this panel about insights to be gained into the complexities and interconnections of the scholarly communications ecosystem that they have gleaned by switching between and among these sectors of publishing, research, and libraries? <clears throat> Yes, Mark? <laughs> well, let's get people warmed up. Um, I don't normally ask questions from the floor, but hey. Um, so, uh, firstly, my personal story of this journey was moving from being a, a, a project management person in insurance and banking to suddenly finding myself selling software to librarians, which was very weird. Um, but the thing that I, I found strangest in that transition was in business, um, time is money. Um, and in academia and libraries, money is money and very scarce, and time is time and very freely available. And it was kind of weird. And the test I applied was if, if you're in a library and you say to your boss, can I go to a conference? Your boss says, how much does it cost and how far away is it? If you go to your boss in business and say, can I go to a conference? They go, how long is it? And it's about these different sectors valuing time and money differently and in business you can spend money to, to, to get something done and in libraries you can spend a lot of time getting something done is it's kind of my experience so I just want to ask the panelists about did they experience that transition of a, of a different kind of value to time and to money as they move between these different sectors well I'll just say um, what I experience is that faculty members um, <coughs> have a different relationship to time and money. Um, and, and that's because money is usually finite for faculty members. Um, and time is, when you're at a privileged institution like mine, time is your own to manage. Um, so that's why it's not that time is endless, it's just that you have the flexibility to manage it yourself. And the money, you don't. Um, so for a faculty member, researcher, it's one thing. Um, but I mean, just, I, you know, I, I, the library that I run is the rarest of the rare thing. I mean, we're, you know, like, I, it'd be hard to even describe the crazy rarity of the materials in our library. We are so bespoke. Um, but that doesn't mean that we're like, hey, you know, whatever, this stuff is all published 400 years ago. What is time? Um, actually, we're on a march mm -hmm. for projects, you know, they need to be done. I want, I want, I want an analysis of what we're doing, how we're uh, getting our workflows accomplished within this month. I want to know what the projection is for a year. Um, so I wouldn't say that within, you know, within my library or even within my research institute that, that time and money were as um, sort of reversed in the way that you suggest. So it's a, I'm hearing you say, Karen, it's a little bit of a, man, a question of sort of like, what control do I have over time and money starts well, yeah. to Yeah, and what is it, it you're doing with it? Yeah. 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 Keith? Um, I realize it's more than, well, at least 25 years ago that I was part of a team that developed a toolkit on project management for university libraries in the <clears> UK. It was part of a, a British library grant. And one of our core principles there was a focus on cost that if you decide you are going to implement a, a library software system, it's not just the cost of the license, but understanding the timeline, the costs involved to help you make an informed decision. Sometimes those costs are unavoidable, but you can control them. I think that there is an, an inherent acceptance that where the mission is driven by financial results, money will be at the forefront of every decision and where there is perhaps an academic mission around research and education money may, may not be the top priority but you can't ignore the costs in a university just as you can't ignore the contribution to science in a publisher i think it's just a, a shift but not a, a complete negation that in one it's all about money and the other it's all about having fun or whatever um, might be the order of the day. So I'm not going to answer your question. I'm going to answer it. 
But it, it reminds me of, again, a metaphor that I started thinking about in discussions of, of people talking past each other about business models and you know who, who really understands their own business model. Commercial publishers and society publishers usually understand the business model where librarians, I would say, their business model is somebody gives us money and we give it away for free. And that, that, there's a certain assumption that comes with that. But the way that I've been thinking about it is the research enterprise, the institution, the library, and the educational mission is inherently artisanal. And that's their strength. And that implies plenty of time. In some institutions, it involves you know, plenty of money, in some not. But that is their focus. And when you're talking about a publisher, one of the big three, but particularly Elsevier, that's moving on the spectrum to, to what you might call industrial. So in order to, to, to support a global, a truly global scholarly ec uh, ecosystem with more submissions coming from China and the ability to uh, manage many different authentication systems in many different uh, countries and in many different sorts of institutions, that industrial scale involves certain commitments of, of time and money, but about efficiency. And in a lot of the conversations I think we're having is an expectation that the institution inherently artisanal or committed to slow food, if you would like, should take on these industrial aspects. And to your point is, do you really understand the total cost of ownership in both time and money that that would take? I'm also struck, Gwen, by something you said earlier about um, libraries are sort of unique within the higher education realm where while we are part of these institutions, we often do our, a lot of our work through consortia, which sit outside our institutions. Um, and yet, and so I don't know if you wanna add anything from that perspective as, as far as like, there's a different kind of money and time that's happening there. Yeah, and, and so I was very active in ICOLC, the International Coalition of Library Consortia, the 100 people in the world that understand what each other does, and nobody under, other, uh, outside of that really understands it. But it, again, it's that if you know one consortium, you know a consortium. There's the all-in state-funded consortium like OhioLink. There's the opt-in 501c3 consortium. So the, the relationship of an individual library to that consortium can vary a lot. Um, the power imbalances can be real depending on the governance structures. And I know that for the 501c3s or the nonprofits, they're struggling with a business transition, you know, because open access has actually upended their own, you know, mm -hmm. business models. Mm -hmm. Whereas the state-funded ones, it's a different risk and relationship depending on you know, where your, your money's coming from. But I think that there is a sense that sometimes you can save time and money by being part of a consortium, and sometimes maybe you don't, but there are other values there, the collaboration, the knowledge sharing. So, I, that is another level, level of complexity, but again, it's like, it's different across the world, yeah. actually. Yeah. yeah. I just thought we have your expertise up here as a consortium lead as well as a librarian, so. Um, another question, if we have any. Um, Antonia? It's a difficult one, <laughs> but I'm just I'm just struck by the the value that you have in having seen both sides of the fence, and yet the world we live in is becoming increasingly soundbite. You know, the loudest voices get heard. 
the attention span to understand the nuances and the expertise that exists is limited. Given the enormity of the challenges that we all face and the recognition that all of us need to work together to address those, take research integrity as one, how do we scale, <laughs> you three, how do we, <laughs> you four, how, how do we, how on earth are we going to bring that more moderate view, that more balanced view to the discussions that we need to be having? Because it feels to me that it's going the opposite direction at the moment and there is more bad perceptions on all different sides um, or maybe the social media just amplifies that, I don't know. But it just feels to me we have this huge challenge about how we scale working together and collaborating together and what kind of governance and framework we need to be able to do that. So the question is, how many hires can we make from one side to the other? <laughs> no. I, I wonder whether um, just one, <clears throat> one critical piece of this is for each and every one of us to be kind of ambassadors for curiosity and goodwill, which sounds really weak sauce in the face of what is happening in the world at large. But honestly, I think curiosity about what other people are do, what other people do, rather than a sense of defensiveness or hostility, is critical. That's and you know I'm always interested in um, in hiring people who are interested in what other people do. You know who are how would you do that? How does that work? You know curiosity and goodwill I think is absolutely essential. So I know that sounds lame and kind of Pollyanna-ish, but. I think it's really important, and perhaps we could put it in the water. You've kind of scared me, Antonio, and make me think about the elections on both <laughs> sides of the Atlantic. Um, I'm, I'm glad I have the chance to vote on both. Um, one thing that I, I'm conscious of, even sitting up here, is that almost all of the conference speaking and webinar presentations that I do these days are joint ventures with publishers. And I think more of that sort of interaction where we can be seen to be talking about a key issue together. And sure, there may be differences in our positions. We may have different desired outcomes. But if we can be in the conversation together, it might tone down some of the heat that we see on social media. And honestly, I've stopped looking at a lot of social media about scholarly publishing because most of it is counterproductive. Um, so, as an example, shameless plug, next week I'm doing a webinar with people from Springer about the impact of transformative agreements and open access mandates and a global um, position where we are all happy and can sing Kumbaya together. We may not get there, but those <laughs> joint conversations are certainly one step in the process. So yes, do we ever, do any of us need more hostility in our mm -hmm. lives? I don't think the answer is yes. Um, and when I, to your point is, is, you know, appearing together, talking together, or one of the questions that um, somebody told me to, to, when someone's very hostile. And it wasn't in a Elsevier library and publisher context, <laughs> but the question was, you should ask them, um, are you open to hearing some information that might change your mind? And if they say no, that's, re <laughs> that's a really bad reflection on us as publishers, as librarians, as researchers. We share a common value, or we say we do, in nuanced, complete, accurate information. And if we can't, as coming together, it's a, it's a professional value of librarianship. It's a professional value of researchers. It's a professional value of, of the, you know, the, the, to your point, the very real commitment that I have found in publishing to advance knowledge and support research that that is something that we should all take very, very seriously. So thank you. Uh, please join me in thanking Karen, Keith, and Gwen for their insights and perspectives. Mm -hmm.